Good morning. morning. Give it one more round of applause for our students. That's... I will say I can take zero credit for the worship at youth. Uh, literally all Jay Lee. She does an absolutely amazing job coordinating all that. So you don't want me to sing. It's not good. Uh, but welcome, everybody. My name is Taylor. I'm the next-gen pastor here at Mosaic. And I get the joy to preach with, to you guys again today. And if you've been with us for a while, we've been in this series of praying the Psalms. We've kind of gone through a variety of different Psalms, a variety of different emotions, and this is actually our final week of doing this sermon series. We're going to be talking about this idea of gratitude and security and satisfaction, especially in our current reality we find ourselves in. Um, So if you remember a few weeks ago, actually, I got to open this series. We talked about this idea of three general types of psalms. There's those that are orientation, the world meets what we expect God says it to do. There's disorientation, where God says it's going to be this way, but I'm experiencing something vastly different. And then there's reorientation, where you kind of come out on the other side of that, and you're like, oh, well, you have this new, renewed vision and perspective on who God is. And today, we're actually going to be talking about one of those uh, reorientation type of psalms. We've kind of been talking more about the disorientation, but I like how we finish this with this idea of a renewed vision and renewed perspective on the Lord. And we're going to be in, so if you have your uh, Bible, you can go up in there now. We're going to eventually be in Psalm 16. And this is a psalm that reflects what it's to be on that other side of that valley, the other side of those hard times, a renewed view of God. Uh, and this is what you could call a Davidic psalm. Uh, so it's accredited to David, King David, uh, the second king, but the prototypical Messiah figure, a big, God, big deal in the Old Testament, the one who really got Israel going and setting up for the success uh, for a short time, but success for a while. And this is associated with him, either he wrote it or it was written for him. There is debate like most things in scripture. Uh, some think it was written by a Levitical priest, a Levitical priest, and we'll kind of talk about that at some point later as well. But the theme and message of this psalm uh, is the same regardless. It is a psalm about confidence and trust in God. As we read it and delve into it, remember that this is written from the perspective of someone who has faced conflict, who has faced adversity, yet they still trust in God. They still give thanks to him regardless of their current situation. This is a faith I hope we can aspire towards. And I will say this now, there is no shame or there, and there is no judgment. If you hear the psalm today and you're like, I don't quite feel that yet. I think one of the great things about prayer, especially praying the psalms, is you can pray, pray psalms of, Lord, I want to be there. Lord, I want to have that confidence in you. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm going to pray this again and again to hopefully get there one day. It is not a mark against you in any way if this doesn't quite connect with your lived experience right now. But I do hope we can walk away from today with this uh, idea that gratitude doesn't always mean that we are in a place of abundance, but a recognition of what God has, is, and will do for us. Gratitude doesn't always mean we are in a place of abundance, but a recognition of what God has, is, and will do for us. Gratitude is more than just being thankful. Gratitude is more than just being satisfied. It's a recognition of who God is. It isn't about ignoring the things around us either, but recognizing God in our lives. True gratitude is based on God and not based on our circumstances. So if you have your Bible, if you haven't opened it up already, no shame. That's going to be on the screen. We're we're just going to read all through Psalm 16 and kind of break it down bit by bit. Uh, but I do encourage you, especially when it comes to Psalms, uh, if you've ever gone to English class, you get that mentality of, hey, we're going to read this poem, we're going to parse it out bit by bit, and it kind of loses some of its like beauty when you do that. Uh, we're going to kind of parse it out a little bit, but I do encourage you to go back and just read the Psalm in its entirety, sit in it, pray it, meditate on it, uh, let the whole Psalm and its beauty really settle in on you. But this is Psalm 16 says this, says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. 
I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever more. Beautiful, beautiful psalm, beautiful poetry. And like many psalms, this one appears to open up with the start of a lament, a sad uh, uh, psalm, a sad piece of literature. A strange opening for a psalm that I said at the beginning was supposed to be all about confidence and trust, but a wise choice for this particular psalm. It is from the perspective of tradition would say uh, of David, of an individual who recognizes that the need for God to protect him. They need the Lord to protect them. It would be difficult, after all, to trust the Lord if there was no need to trust in God. If you know what I mean? If we uh, had things all in control of our own self, if we had everything, we could do everything on our own, why would I need to trust in the Lord? But the speaker calls out and says to God, you are my refuge. The opening phrase there of preserve me, some translations might say protect me or keep me. Uh, when I started reading this, it made me, reminded me of my, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture back all the way in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 2.15, it reads, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work, to work it and keep it all the way back in the garden of Eden. The very first commandment that God ever gave humanity was to work it, to make it flourish, to make it prosper, to make it healthy, and to keep it, to preserve it. The Hebrew word here is shamar, to make sure that it is protected from all outside forces. This is what David is opening this psalm with, of, Lord, protect me, be my refuge. God is saying, in you is the only place I can find safety, warmth, victory over all evil that wants to overcome me. And David's life was definitely marked with conflict. I had one professor call David the bloody king because he, his whole reign was marked by warfare and conflicts. Uh, so much that when Solomon became king, his son later on, Solomon very rarely had to have war or conflict because David did such a huge, magnificent job of setting up the kingdom for him. His life was marked by invaders that trying to dethrone him, his own family trying to dethrone him, adversaries that David needed, needed to conquer. And on his reflection of his reality, it made him realize that, God, I need you. I need you to protect me. You are my sole refuge. This is coming from the king of kings, the king of all kings in Israel's history, the one who did it all. This was a man who was marked by power and authority, and he recognized, even I need Lord's protection. He recognizes that apart from the Lord, he uses the, the divine name Yahweh here quite often, that there is no good apart from God. The opening doesn't give us a specific event or conflict here like some Psalms do, but it's a reminder of his Confidence and trust is based on the foundation solely of the Lord, what he's done in his life, what he can do in his life. This is a psalm of someone who has gone through hard times and comes out the other side with a new revitalized perspective on who God is in a world in the midst of chaos. This is a psalm of gratitude and satisfaction in God. Which brings me to my first main point of today when it comes to navigating this idea of gratitude and security and satisfaction, and is that we are to recognize our reality while focusing on the divine. To be recognizing our reality, but focusing on the divine. The psalm opens with a lament, recognizing 
clearly that the world we are in is a place where we need refuge. We need help from something greater than this world. It is not ignoring the circumstances that we are in. It is not putting on blinders and walking down a path of blissful ignorance. David sees that all good in him and in the world comes from God. Recognizing the reality and then focusing on the divine who ultimately has authority over all things. His saying to God, I see all this messed up stuff in my life, my family, my relationships, my career, and God, I know that you are there still. I know that without you, all these things would be meaningless and pointless. As it says in Ecclesiastes, all things would be vapor. That apart from you, there is no good and there is no hope. Our present experience, whatever it is we may be experiencing, does not negate the truth that apart from God, there is no good. This is the foundation of all gratitude, and it's based on the divine. Something has happened in our life, especially in David's life here, to remind him to always focus on the Father in heaven, despite what he is saying around him. And that's the basis of gratitude. It should be based on God. It shouldn't be based on our circumstances. And David continues to reflect on this confidence as he goes through the psalm. It reads here in verses three and four, he says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom all my, whom it is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. Which brings us to our second point here today is that he recognizes who he is with but focuses on the saints. We are to recognize who we are with, but focus on the saints. Like David, we are all surrounded by a wide variety of people, as, as we should be. We have some who, have the, who are searching, seeching after the heart of the Lord, and some who don't, some who delight in God's teaching, and those who don't quite understand it yet. And again, building on this tension between reality and the divine, David finds delight and confidence in those around him who delight in God. Saying, I delight in the Lord because I see others delighting in the Lord. The life of the saint, or what he calls the excellent ones, bring him joy in his own circumstance. And this should be an encouragement to us today. We should be encouraged to allow others to see that we delight in the Lord because it brings delight to our brothers and sisters. When we express gratitude towards God, when we show confidence in the Lord in the face of reality, it comforts and encourages those around us who are watching us, especially those who are Christ followers. David compares these two groups of the saints and the ones who run after other gods. And I love the comparison of images he uses here. Uh, you see back in verse one, he called the Lord Yahweh his refuge. Uh, at least for me, when I think of a refuge, I think of a solitary place, a huge a fortress, uh, walls, a city, a place you know where you can run to to be safe and be comforted and be known. Something we know we can flee to the midst of. It's not changing, it's not moving, it's always there compared with those who are just running after other gods. And the word that the text used here is a word that's supposed to bring on uh, feelings of anxiety and hasty, hasty moving. It's not a word of confidence. Those who are running after other gods, seeking the good that David knows and that we know only comes from the one true God, they're multiplying their sorrows with more sorrows, only going to find more pain from their other gods. This is the image building on, because many people back in the day of Israel, uh, they had a tendency to, uh, to hedge their bets, you could say. Uh, they would go worship uh, God in Jerusalem, but then they would also go worship other gods like Baal or Asherah or El. Kind of a way of saying, hey, at least if one of these things is right, might as well hit, hit all the boxes. I'm gonna go do all, all these things to kind of make sure I'm covered in case this one's wrong or this one's right. Unfortunately, for the gods back in the day, the worship for them was, even by their standards, pretty bad, pretty horrifying. Uh, you, things would, ranging from drinking the blood of animals, self-mutilation, sacrificing of own children, all these things were done in the name of worshiping other gods for their own safety. Essentially, they were trying to overcome their sorrows 
by inflicting more sorrows on themselves or others. And thankfully, there may not be uh, any God worship today that requires those kind of rituals and worship. But I would argue that there are still plenty of false refugees, refugees that we are running after that require us to solve our current sorrows with more sorrows. The rituals may have changed, but the reasoning behind it is still all too similar. So when I say that we recognize those around us and focus on the saints, it means that we see those who are delighting in the Lord and learn from them and not those who are aimlessly chasing after false gods of whatever it may be. We should delight in those who delight in the Lord. Seeing their walk and taking encouragement for our own. And this is not saying we should compare ourselves to others. I don't think that is what we're supposed to do here. It's seeing others facing adversity and being encouraged by, wow, that is amazing that they have that confidence. It is not saying, man, I could never have that level of confidence. I could never face that tragedy and be as confident as that person. Because if you're doing that, you're still comparing yourself to them. Rather, I want us to think, thank the Lord they have given them that confidence. Focus on the divine still, even in that. Even that slight difference in perspective and change of looking is acknowledging God rather than uh, focusing on God while also acknowledging the reality. Part of showing gratitude is recognizing the hard and the difficult. Gratitude is not about ignoring the bad. It is recognizing the hard, is recognizing the bad and focusing on the divine based on who God has proven himself to be throughout all of human history, through your life, through the other's life, other people's lives in your life. And the psalm goes on to kind of point, okay, how, how do we do this? What, what does this look like in practice? So we go on to verse five and eight here, where it says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. And I'll apologize now. My inner Bible nerd is going to come out even more in this uh, section. I can't help it. I love it. Uh, I just want to apologize to you now. But the psalm is using all these different images uh, that the Israelites would know and really latch onto to convey this idea of blessing and gratitude, uh, especially this, this idea here of we are to recognize our blessings, but focus on the one who blesses. Recognize our blessings while focusing on the one who blesses. We first, we have this image of a cup, which is pretty common throughout all of scripture. It's supposed to convey love and comfort, strength and fellowship. Uh, Biblical writers use it as a symbol to represent all the benefits that God has given and provides. We are primed with the image of God as the one who's giving provision and life to David here. The one who ultimately has all things in his hands. All things come from him. All things are under his domain. This is the confidence as someone who knows the Lord and is the sustainer of all things, despite all that has happened in his past. And then this is the really nerdy bit, so I apologize. We get into this talk of land and lots and portion and inheritance. And for land is a huge, huge deal when it comes to the nation of Israel. I think for like our culture and Western culture, land is just another commodity that we're supposed to purchase and buy even if it's really expensive. Uh, it's, it's something, it's more a resource. It's not something we hold a lot of value to naturally. Uh, it's just a, another need or wants. But Israel, land was a huge, huge deal for them. When they were coming into the promised land after the exodus from Egypt, uh, they, would, they were told, hey, go occupy, go take the promised land. There's people living there now, but God, I have promised it to you Go and conquer. And there's a variety of tribes there, like the Canaanites, Philistines, uh, kind of think those kind of tribes, other ones as well. And God had told Moses, hey, this is, your, this is your land. This is the land flowing with milk and honey that I have promised your forefathers. This is, this is for you. And when they were to go uh, take it over, they were given uh, 
lots, the land allotments through lots, which essentially just randomish assignments based on the discernment of casting lots by someone who knew who the Lord was. So when eventually Joshua led the people of Israel into Israel, he assigned the 12 tribes their land. And it was essentially, hey, if you were the part of the tribe of Reuben, this is your land. Your whole family is going to settle here. The tribe of uh, Asher, you're going to go here. Tribe of Benjamin, you're going to go here. This is kind of just the general. So if you look at a map of Israel, there's 12 sections there. And their land allotments and tribal lands was a big deal to these people. They took huge pride and value in it. Even if it wasn't the best land, they were supposed to take the land they had and prosper it, work it, and keep it. Uh, A lot of conflict actually in the Old Testament comes from either tribes or uh, individual members of tribes not being happy with the land that the Lord had given them or not going to it. One of the stories that come to mind is... uh, Naboth's vineyard, if you ever want to read it, it's in 1 Kings 21. But essentially the king of Israel came to Naboth and said, hey, I want your vineyard. Your vineyard is great. It's close by. I will give you literally whatever you want. 10 times the value of your vineyard. I will give you another better vineyard if you want it. And Naboth was like, no, this is, this is my inheritance. This is my tribe's land. This is where my family grew up. This is the land that God gave my ancestors. So I'm going to stay here no matter what. And eventually the story goes on where the king and uh, the queen of the time uh, convict him of a false crime, kill him, steal his land, and this whole downturn of that kingdom begins there. But this idea of blessing is associated with this prosperity. Land is a huge deal. There's a reason Blessing is closely associated with fruitful harvest, prosperity, bearing children. All this is associated with this idea. And it's supposed to be God gave them land to cultivate, to keep. It was given to them out not of the person's individual will, but out of God's will. All of this comes from God. I will say there is one exception to this rule. It's kind of where that Levitical priest idea comes into the Psalms a little bit. All the tribes got land allotments except one, and it was the Levites because they were the priestly, they're the priestly tribe. Essentially, they were supposed to rely on all the other tribes who had land, who had crops, who had cattle, to go to the temple and give them uh, the sacrifices of the Lord, and they got to take part of it. So all tribes got land except this one. So when you read the Psalms, when you read to the section where it says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. All these images should be flooding your mind as you're reading the psalm. The psalmist is reflecting on the tangible reality that all blessings that he has in front of him have come from God and God alone. He recognizes the blessings and thanks the one who gives the blessings. If it was the biblical priest who was reading this, this psalm is even more powerful because he's saying, Lord, to where my lines have fallen, I have no tangible land, but I have been given in a place where I get to experience your blessings each day, each week, each month, each year. Though my lines may have fallen with no land, I still have a beautiful inheritance because Lord, you have given me them. The lines have fallen in a place where I am thankful because ultimately it all comes from God. It is very easy to see blessings we have in front and focus on those things, to get lost in the things, the tangibles, rather than the one who has given them. It is the nature of our flesh to do this. And David points to the image here saying, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. It says in verse seven, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel and the night also my kidneys instruct me is what the actual text says here. Uh, It's a really weird translation thing here, but the kidneys is actually uh, a very common image here. It's supposed to, the kidneys in Israel was that's where all your emotions and temperaments and vigor and wisdom was all rooted. Very strange image, I know. But it's this idea used to be translated as reigns. So you could read this as In the night also the reins of my inner self instruct me rather than hearts. It was the kidneys are what guide the individual in the world, how they react and how they respond to the world around them. This is David saying, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel my whole life. All all the things that guide me even when I sleep 
instruct me in the ways of the Lord. David has made a conscious effort to set the Lord as a place of prominence, to focus on the one who blesses. So much that his inner being and the reins are wanting to follow the Lord. The Lord is in his mind's eyes at a place where when he goes to bed, he is reflecting on the counsel of the Lord, whether it's through scripture, through uh, prayer, through guidance of his fellow saints of the land, his community, and it's rooting his confidence in that reality of God. A commentator once wrote here that well, as you're sleeping, instead of counting sheep, you should be talking to the shepherd. So much of his life is not focused on the blessings, but on the one who blesses. God's counsel is most effective when the individual's consciousness becomes aware of his own shortcoming, being self-aware that they are in the need of the Lord for all things in life. The idea is we recognize our blessings focusing on the one who blesses. Gratitude comes from recognizing our realities, the surroundings, our blessings, but it always comes back to focusing on the divine, those who delight in the Lord, the one who blesses. It's always rooted in God. This is how we're able to feel secure and satisfied in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. And I I know I maybe sound like I'm repeating myself here a little bit, but Uh, I do want to make sure I make this clear is I don't want us to slip into this place of feeling when we're talking about gratitude of either one guilty for not having this renewed confidence and ordered gratitude in the Lord or two feeling like we need to, hey, suck it up, be happy in your life. Uh, That's not what I think the Lord is saying. He does not what the Psalm I think is saying here. Gratitude is more than that. I don't want you to feel in any way that you are unusual because you don't quite have this level of confidence yet. This can be a prayer of aspiration of, Lord, I want to get to this place of confidence in you, but right now, Lord, I can't. I'm in that valley. I know the right things, but Lord, what I'm feeling isn't quite there. I can say that is okay. There's a reason I haven't used language today of saying, hey, we need to be grateful because a lot of other people have it worse than we do. Uh, that's not what gratitude is based off. You're still comparing yourself and others. And while I do think perspective is important here, especially when we live in a developed Western uh, metropolitan area, yes, we do have things that other places don't. Perspective is important, but that shouldn't be what our gratitude is based off of. Uh, you can be extremely rich or extremely poor and still have experiences that bring trauma and anxiety and pain. That mindset is still comparing others instead of focusing on the Lord. When I think the psalm is trying to say about gratitude is that David is able to find satisfaction in his life regardless of situation because the Lord is his focus. His gratitude based on what God has done in history, in his life, in others' life that allows him to see the world around him and say, yes, this is all messed up, but regardless of that, I know I can still trust in the Lord. Remember, gratitude doesn't always mean that we are in a place of abundance, but a recognition of what God has, is, and will do. Gratitude is based on God, not on our circumstance. You can have gratitude for the Lord if you have all the things in the world or if you have nothing in the world. The psalm closes with all this reflection in verse 9 through 11, and it says, Therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure, mind, body, and soul. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ultimately, ultimately, in response to what God has done in his life, what he has given to David, his response is nothing but confidence. His whole being, mind, heart, soul, kidneys, finds security in God. As he said in the beginning, apart from God, there is no good. David is aware that his gratitude is not based on things or situation, but on God's promises and his track record throughout all of history. This is a faith based on something more powerful than anything the world can throw at him. And this psalm actually has some history in uh, 
the New Testament as well. We haven't got quite into it. But there's very few texts in the Old Testament that actually allude to this idea of resurrection. It's a very uncommon thing in the Old Testament, actually. Because of that, it makes an appearance in the New Testament uh, by both Peter and Paul. But uh, first year, Peter, in his first sermon, this is after Jesus' resurrection, uh, thousands of years later, after David's reign, after David has slept, has died, he goes, they, Peter reads this and reflects on it and sees something more here. Like many things in the Old Testament, especially prophetic text, they point to something greater than what they would ever realize. When David wrote this, or this was written for David, he wasn't thinking about the Messiah of Jesus to come, but it pointed to something even greater. When it says, when it, we go back and know the story of Jesus and we read things like, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, your holy ones won't see corruption, at the right hand your pleasures forevermore, in your presence the fullness of joy, make known to me the path, the way of life. All these images of Jesus come to us because we know where the story ends. We know where Jesus comes into it. David didn't know this, but Peter, seeing the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, sees this psalm, reads those last three verses to a crowd for his very first sermon, an uneducated man, and says this. He says, fellow Israelites, I cannot tell you confidently, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor see his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. David didn't have Jesus to base his gratitude on, but we have the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. Our gratitude is based on something that we know happened, that has changed the course of human history. We can take confidence in that, just as David took confidence that in God to be his refuge in his time of need. The Lord protects, the Lord preserves in those days, just as he does in our day. David was calling for deliverance from death in this psalm. We know that Jesus has conquered that death. Hear me when I say that Jesus has already won. We can take refuge in the victor now and today. Our portion, our inheritance, our lots is greater than anything we can ever imagine, greater than what David could have imagined. So as we move into a time of worship, I hope that you hear me say today that this is not a psalm about pull yourself up by your bootstraps, be happy, ignore the things around you. Your life is better than other people's lives. That's not what the psalm is saying. The psalm is saying that we have a God who hears. When we call out to him, we say, preserve me, keep me, O Lord, he hears. A Lord who does protect, a Lord who we can base our gratitude in, if not quite today. And hear me say that I, I don't want, one of the hardest parts of this sermon for me to write was, I don't want you to hear me say that you need to be great, you need to have gratitude right now, even if you don't feel it. I feel like you can get lost in this idea of you, need, you have to force happiness. But I think if we focus on the divine, if we pray this psalm as, Lord, I want to be there, Lord. I want to have this confidence in you, Lord. I want to trust you, Lord. I know you are good, but God, I'm just not feeling it right now. Let this be a psalm of aspiration for you. Let this be a prayer of the Lord will get you there. Heart change doesn't come from our own forced work, our own forced will. We can't make our heart of stone become a heart of flesh. Only the Lord can. So pray the psalm. Go back, read the psalm in its entirety. Write it down, whatever you can do. But your gratitude should be based on the Lord. It's not based on your circumstance. As we go into worship, just be prayerful of that. Lord, how can I, be, how can I have security and safety in you? 
Lord, you are good. Lord, help me know that. Help me believe that. Help me understand that. So I'm going to close us in prayer and we're going to go into worship uh, and just be thankful. That's my prayer for myself, to be thankful. This summer is crazy. We're about to go into a season of life of hopefully more routine if you have kids. Uh, but just be, let's recognize the blessings we have, but always focus on the one who gives us those blessings. Please bow your head. Dear Lord, we come to you knowing you are good. God, that is that is a truth, that is fact. And God, I pray that we get to a place where we can understand you more, feel your presence more. And God, we recognize that our situations are varied and different, but Lord, you are present in all of them, Lord. That our gratitude is based on you, because Lord, you have proven throughout all of human history that you do come through ultimately in your son whose life, death, and resurrection prove that death and sorrows have no power over us, God. And God, other we're on this journey to understanding you more and more, God, I just pray that you reveal yourself through scriptures to us, through community to us, God, whatever way you can, God, because we, we can't put you in a box, Lord. You can work in ma- magnificent ways and we can't even understand it, God. God, I thank you for this. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the things big and small, seen and unseen, that the very God who has set the stars in the sky has decided to have a relationship with each and every one of us individually and known. God, you were good. In your name we pray. Amen.